Good morning. How are we? Right. For those of you who are not part of ELIS, I'm sorry, wrong class. Uh, for those of you who are not part of um, EDFN 1501 with my class, thank you so much for joining us. I see that our special guest today has just joined our class and got a few more people joining here for those of you who are already here i just wanted to remind you if you're uh if you're in my class or if you're not normally in my class we do record our zoom sessions so um these will be accessible later if you would like to view this zoom session at a later date please email me for the Zoom link. So I don't post the Zoom link um, publicly, but I do provide the Zoom link to students who request it. My email, for those of you who are not in my class, is llewis02 at ysu.edu. And for those of you who don't know me personally, I am Dr. Lillian Lewis, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Teacher Education and Leadership Studies. And I am a cross-appointed faculty in a yet-to-be-named department. We used to just be Department of Art, but now we're the Department of Art, Theater, and Dance. And I don't know what our official name is yet, because we just, we just um, reconfigured in January. So it's a new and exciting partnership. And as a, uh, as a former theater kid, I am excited to bring some um, bright minds on board. But my primary, my primary home department is teacher education and leadership studies. And in the teacher education and leadership studies program, I work with the um, early childhood intervention, um, intervention specialist program. And I, and I worked with faculty in that program to redesign um, the coursework so that it is a four year degree. And in the context of that um, degree, I, I teach about early childhood curriculum and pedagogy that utilizes um, creative pedagogies particularly. Um, and also thinking about uh, arts integration in terms of curriculum development. Uh, so that's a little background about me, but you're not here to see me. Those of you who see me in class twice a week, uh, you have already seen plenty of me. And we did a fast and furious overview of philosophy in and of education on Tuesday. Um, and we, we focus primarily on Western philosophies um, because your textbook emphasizes those. And we kind of touch on non-Western philosophy to a small extent. Um, but I felt that in looking at the textbook, there was so much more we could say, uh, but there's a limitation to my knowledge base. And so as, as I have typically done when I teach Introduction to Education, I, I feel it's important to, um, to make this as rich and as meaningful as it can be. This is meant to be both kind of a broad and deep introduction. So there are certain points where we really want to give you uh, a strong foundation because you're building on this through the program. So whether you are recently graduated from high school or you are coming to education because you've realized that it is a phenomenal degree with lifelong um, meaning that uh, makes an impact not only on students but on society in general, 
or if you're a returning student, we have a wide variety of folks who are in um, Introduction to Education. And so I welcome all of you. And if you're here from a different class besides Intro to Education, um, we welcome you as well. So if you are further along in your if you're if you're further along in your program and you're joining us as a guest, we're happy to have you. And um, I don't want to eat up Dr. Rocha's time. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rocha, and then I'm going to mute my mic so that he has the floor. And um, I'll also, before I mute, I'll double check and see if he wants to share his screen or any content. But first and foremost, let me give you a, a quick introduction to Dr. Rocha. Dr. Rocha was born in Texas and um, he has moved all across the US. He's lived in Texas, Utah, Ohio, and he's also lived in Reynosa, Mexico. He began playing guitar at the age of five. His undergraduate degree is from Steubenville, Ohio, and you may have been there. He has a BA in philosophy and Spanish literature. He um, worked as an educator in the Transfiguration Catholic School and from 2007 to 2010, Dr. Rocha completed an MA and a PhD in philosophy of education at The Ohio State University as a Gates Fellow. So you may be familiar with that university, uh, two and a half hours away in the beautiful city of Columbus in the heart of Ohio. So currently he is faculty at University of British Columbia. And, um, and I wanna to note too that Dr. Rocha um, is a prolific author and um, his most recent, uh, I should say the, the publication I'm familiar with that I've had a chance to look at is the 2015 book, Folk Phenomenology, Education Study and the Human Person and a book I recently ordered that is hot off the presses is a book entitled The Syllabus as Curriculum, A Reconceptualist Approach and that was published this year. So. It's not hot off the presses. I'm just a little slow to, um, I'm a slow to order books. So in any case, uh, Rocha's work, uh, as he says, orbits his philosophical, musical, and religious interests. And in contrast to his formal training in academic letters, he is a folk musician. And so he doesn't just think formally as a scholar and academic in, um, in philosophy, but he also, is a um he he composes music and performs music on a regular basis so he is truly a, a renaissance man and um without further ado I, you know we could we could just talk about all of his accomplishments but that would eat up all the time and what he has to say to you which is why you're here so let me turn it over to dr rosha and dr rosha do you need um do you need to share screen or anything? No, I think I should be good. Do you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. So I'm gonna mute and it's all yours. Great, thank you so much, Eileen. Um, well, it's uh, I'm calling in from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada. So it is 6.38 in the morning over here. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I am going to be uh, sipping away at my first cup of coffee um, I normally don't, uh, allow myself to interact with human beings before the end of my first cup of coffee. Um, so I hope I can, uh, uh, behave myself here, uh, with this one exception. Uh, but it's really great to be, uh, with you, albeit virtually. Um, it's, uh, really great to be in touch with, uh, folks from the state of Ohio, I, uh, I did both my undergrad and my PhD in Ohio, uh, despite not being from there. So uh, I feel like that's worth, uh, you know, seven years of my life. Um, and so have a lot of, uh, a lot of great, uh, a lot of great memories fr from the great state of Ohio and um, return there. Uh, whenever COVID isn't on, I try to make it a point to go back to uh, a small conference in uh, the outskirts of Dayton, Ohio, in Beaver Creek. A lot of people call it Dayton, but if you, I think if you're from the area, you know it's not actually Dayton. Anyhow, so uh, and that's one of the places where I've been able to interact a bit with Dr. Lewis, and 
Um, she even came out here uh, a couple summers ago, and that was great too. Anyhow, I'm going to take uh, maybe just the first um, the first few minutes to introduce a bit of my work in philosophy of education, but I'm less interested in introducing you to sort of my own personal work in philosophy of education, and I'm probably a little bit more interested, if it's okay with you, in puzzling through just a very simple question, which is sort of, um, you might ask it in one of two ways. On the one hand, like, what in the world is philosophy of education? Uh, not just as an academic field, but like, what's meaningful about saying those three words, philosophy of and education together? Um, what do they indicate? And also, what do they perhaps not indicate so much? Um, that kind of thing. And then uh, another way of, of probably ask, asking the same question, which is, uh, what is the relationship between philosophy and education, education and philosophy? Because obviously anybody, I think, can can move maybe quickly from the first question and say, well, whatever it is, it has to do with this apparent relationship between the two biggest words of those three words, philosophy and education. So what is that relationship? What does it consist of? Um, what perhaps are maybe the, the conditions of, of it um, and, and that kind of stuff. So that's going to probably be more um, more of what I, I want to puzzle through, mainly because I find it extremely difficult to talk about my interests or my work mainly because I have never been the kind of person who works through a sort of clear, understood, predetermined interest. I actually feel like a lot of my career um, and, and, and a lot of my work has been almost um, surfing, like riding a wave of ideas and interests and circumstances and accidents and things that I, in many cases, don't feel like I have perfect command or control of but that I'm fortunate, or in some cases actually unfortunate, to um, to undergo an experience and sort of the work flows from that. I know we often think of academics and scholars as people who are sort of in control of their research agenda, but I have to confess that I've never felt that way myself. I've always felt um, like the agenda has me more than I have it in many cases. Um, uh, and I don't know if, if that makes sense or not, though, but uh, feel free to ask questions, by the way, to interject. Um, I do teach on Zoom right now, so I'm moderately comfortable if you, for instance, drop a question into the chat while I'm speaking. Um, I have the chat box open here to my left side, so I will see it. Um, and, um, and and I don't mind pausing and, and addressing a question that comes through through there, or if you want to put up the infamous blue hand or whatever that hand is, uh, feel free to do that. Or even if you want to interject, just kind of unmute yourself and say, excuse me. <laughs> um, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, because uh, I'd like to get out of this stage of talking about what is philosophy of education, what is the relationship between philosophy and education, uh, fairly quickly, hopefully. Um, and, and move on to some of your questions, which I've I had a chance to read uh, last night and that I, uh, that I think are, are very interesting. And in some cases that I didn't exactly understand. And so I would want to ask questions about the questions first in order to be able to maybe uh, see if I, if I know something or not about those things. Um, okay. Well, biographically, so in terms of just my life, um, I studied philosophy for a, a number of reasons. One of them is that I was exposed to philosophy kind of early in my life, in, in high school at least, uh, because I was I was very active within a um, a particular form of competitive uh, forensics or or speech and debate in high school, and so that um, that literally enabled me to attend a uh, a summer camp, a debate camp that I was. Uh, uh, attended on a, on a university interscholastic leave, the UIL. Um, it's a Texas uh, institution that, that oversees academics and sports and stuff, extracurriculars. And so I, I was able to qualify for a scholarship from there and, 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 and go and attend that, um, uh, that, uh, that camp in, in the summer of, of, of 1999, which you could say in some ways kind of transformed my life. Um, 
my parents didn't go to college and no one in my family has gone to college before and so I had never really been in a college campus before um, and and I certainly had never been inside of, of a lecture hall or, or of, a, of, a, of a research library or these kinds of things and you know whatever you think of Baylor University today uh, from my point of view it, it, it might have it been it was Oxford, it was Cambridge, it was the University of Paris, it was Salamanca, it was, you know, the archives of Alexandria, it was everything to me at that time. Um, and uh, one of the things they, they, they gave all the participants in that camp was a small uh, resource library of abridged texts of political philosophy, because most of the tools for, for uh, Lincoln-Douglas style debate um, was from political philosophy. So we, we were given these abridged texts that had like some some of the primary texts at the front and on the back some commentaries of how you can kind of put this to work in, in your debate case and, and win a lot of uh, tournaments and stuff. And so I, uh, uh, I was first exposed to, you could say, primary texts in philosophy um, in, in, in that sense uh, at that camp. Um, I also had a very religious upbringing uh, within the Catholic Church, and, and while we didn't have, a, uh, uh, there weren't a lot of resources uh, growing up, one of the resources that was always there just through the institution uh, of, of the church was uh, libraries and books and, and, and people who uh, invariably uh, had opinions about anything and everything. And I suspect that a lot of my talent for debate was actually prefabricated in my um, upbringing, uh, my, my, my religious upbringing. Um, and then along with all of that, I've played guitar since I was five. Um, and in some senses, the guitar is this kind of uh, medium or this uh, place or this site where I've been developing this kind of language uh, through fingers and muscle memory um, and and chords and and while I've taken that for granted most of my life, uh, I've become more and more aware that maybe even more primary than my religious upbringing was this very particular mode of uh, expression and, and also uh, this particular tool of expression in the um, in, in, in the guitar and my relationship to that instrument. Um, for, you might say, Sam, I thought, what in the world does it have to do with philosophy and education? Well, the point is that I went to college and I studied philosophy for all the reasons I gave, both known and unknown to me. At the time, all I knew mainly was the Baylor story. I hadn't quite considered the, the extent to which there were, you know, other reasons. I know that now because because I'm 38 and I'm not 18, right? Um, but um, when I when I studied philosophy, my encounter with philosophy was on the one hand exciting because I was finally able to make good on some of that early exposure and be able to kind of do it at a depth and to a degree that I, that I didn't even quite imagine I would be able to. I also found it very alienating. <laughs> uh, my experience of studying philosophy in Ohio, far away from my family, uh, far away in, in many ways culturally from, from, from who I felt I was and, and, and those things, um, I remember distinctly sitting in a, in a, in a room uh, in a course on philosophy of community and saying, I don't know if I know what community is, but I don't like any of these people. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I, I don't have any, like, if if one has to study community with a bunch of losers like this, I, I'd rather be alone. Like, you know, this is very kind of, again, who knows, maybe I was having a bad mood, maybe I needed a Snickers bar, you know. All I recall, though, is that there was, there was this alienating feeling that was influenced probably in some ways by some of my other studies, literature and stuff like that. But by the time I finished my, my college, um, I was pretty much done with philosophy. I, I had been told, at least, that I should consider going to graduate school and, and to get a, like a PhD in, in philosophy proper and, and that there were... Um, that maybe some of my abilities in the academic discipline could be uh, put to work there. But again, I, I never, you know, I came from, I was a first generation college student. I, uh, graduate school seemed pretty, uh, pretty fancy for, for me. I, I, I wasn't as interested in it. And, uh, and also I was engaged. So I, I wanted to get, so I, I wanted to get married and we were going to move back uh, to Minnesota where my, uh, where my wife is from uh, the Twin Cities. And, uh, and so we did, so we did. And uh, so I graduated from college with this degree in philosophy, 
this this kind of uh, pretty intense uh, academic training and preparation, but not but but completely feeling like I was walking away from the discipline and walking away from philosophy. And this is just an early way to say this is what philosophy is to me. It's this thing that I've had this relationship with that that I felt like at one point in time I walked away from. Um, I then uh, was teaching kindergarten in a small um, uh, parochial school in Oakdale, Minnesota. Uh, and I was a Gates scholar. Uh, I, was a, I, I, I was the sophomore class of the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Millennium Scholarship uh, Foundation uh, Fund, which really targets um, low socioeconomic uh, and, and minority uh, uh, students. Um, and so I was fortunate to, 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 to find out about that scholarship and much less to get it. Um, but, it but it went far beyond undergrad. Uh, I, it, I, I discovered that it also funded graduate degrees. And so all of a sudden I, I kind of felt like I'd be wasting it if I just stopped going to school. And if someone was going to pay for my school bill, it felt like I should you know, u use that. And so I enrolled at the University of St. Thomas and there uh, in the School of Education because I was teaching uh, kindergarten. And so it seemed like this matched my interests much more uh, than philosophy uh, would have. And so I went there to study uh, education, not really knowing like what in the world is education. Like I didn't have an undergraduate degree in education. I never taken a course in education. I was teaching Spanish, but I was probably one of those notoriously unprepared, uncertified uh, teachers that Catholic schools hire from time to time to, you know, to, to teach just because of uh, uh, the fact that I spoke Spanish. It was my native language. Oh, thank you, buddy. Thanks, pal. That's my son, Gabe. <laughs> He's bringing me coffee reinforcements. Um, anyhow, when I got to St. Thomas, I met uh, a man by the name of Stephen Brookfield, who was kind of my mentor there. And uh, it just so happened I got lucky. He had just arrived from Teachers College in Columbia, and uh, not Col not Colombia, like in South America, but the Columbia University in New York City. Um, and he um, uh, he had an interest in, in philosophy and more of an orientation to like critical theory and sociology. And these and social theory and sociology were, were 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 not a part of my training, so it was good to fill those gaps and read uh, those texts. But increasingly. As you may not be surprised from my previous story, my my reaction to the study of education was far worse than my re than my negative reaction to philosophy. I was absolutely unhinged in my dissatisfaction with the what I felt was infantilizing intellectual climate of the school of education, and I was well, bitter, really, because again, it was like, you know, I didn't come from an intellectual class or whatever, but whenever I clearly know from my measly undergraduate education that you, some of you are out to lunch, like, you know, come on, you're supposed to be better. Like I was, <laughs> I was really, uh, I was, I was not uh, a model of, of, of positivity and civil discourse. But Stephen took mercy on me, and he kind of pulled me aside one day, and he said, Sam, you told me once that you uh, left philosophy behind, you, you claim. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 that's in the past. You know, I, I walked away from that. He's like, okay, I mean, I guess I believe you, but you're kind of obsessed with it, or the way you talk and the way you deal with texts, it's not obvious that you walked away from it. And then you're really unhappy here. You, 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 you really hate kind of everything we're reading, and, and, you're, and you're kind of... You know, you're acting like a 22 year old, which I was at the time. Um, no offense to 22 year olds here, um, but but I was acting, you know, uh, like I knew everything from my undergrad and so on and so forth. And he's like, so if I gather this, you kind of hate philosophy. I was like, yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, it's alienating. It, it it's, it's not a not a discipline that's for me. And just because I'm good at it doesn't mean I, I I'm interested in it. Okay. And you really don't like education. You're increasingly disenchanted, not only with the study of education, but with your own experience as a school teacher. You're you're getting into all kinds of trouble with your principal. Uh, and I was like, yeah, 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 okay. Well, it sounds to me that you don't you have a very negative relationship to both philosophy and to education, including to schooling. I think you're a philosopher of education, <laughs> and you should kind of get that checked out. Um, and so he kind of performed a diagnostic <laughs> um, 
reading of, of me and and what I had done up to then. And he's the one who cued to me the idea that there was this thing called philosophy of education uh, that I could go out and, and, and look at. And so I submitted a paper on his like pointing to a small society in Chicago uh, that they accepted. Um, and I went there and read my paper in front of a room with three people in it. And one of those three people was the chair of the Department of Psychology and Philosophy of Education at Ohio State University, who kind of pulled like a football coach move and offered me like a, a scholarship in the hallway. <laughs> and again, I so I, you know, after a long time of figuring out if I could go to uh, such a school and stuff, um, I ended up going there. So my relationship to philosophy and education is not something that I came to myself. It's it's not an idea or a field or a discipline that I um, intentionally uh, went out and grabbed. It was something that someone diagnosed in me and, uh, and, and allowed me to discover for myself. Uh, and I think that in some sense, the relationship between philosophy and, ed and education um, is like any relationship between two things that aren't obviously related to each other. It's arbitrary. I think we have to begin with that. Um, I don't. I don't like these people pretending that there's all these, you know, deep mystical relationships between things that aren't, like, way more obvious than you know. Um, and so I think that the relationship between philosophy and education is arbitrary simply because there's no necessary relation between the things onto themselves. So what is the relationship between philosophy and philosophy? Like, what is philosophy? Well, one thing you'll find if you go to any conference in the world is that philosophers don't know. Philosophy is one of the few disciplines where the discipline only agrees on the fact that it doesn't know what it is. It has next to, now, you know, it can go etymologically, oh, philosophia means love of wisdom. What does that mean? What's the relationship between love and wisdom? Um, it can get into sort of the more technical academics aspects of the field, the distinction between analytic, Anglo-analytic philosophy that's very kind of logic-centered and, and almost mathematical, and continental philosophy, which is more literary, in some cases religious, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but I mean, the continent is really referring to Europe, which is really referring to France and Germany, and Anglo-analytic, where is it on the Anglo? It's it's the Anglo sphere. It's it's the UK. I mean, that's arbitrary. I mean, just three countries of the whole world. Like, come on. Um, the point I'm making is that I think the the anyone who wants to understand philosophy for its own sake, much less a subfield or subdiscipline of something like philosophy of education, should not. Um, I claim should not take it on terms that are not explicitly and and avowedly arbitrary. Um, there is nothing decided here. There's nothing obvious to the most seasoned expert. And the degree to which textbooks or others try to convince you that there's some mystical link between things is usually to sell the book and less to tell you the truth. Um, and it's usually to sort of give some uh, airs of appearance of a kind of rigor or a kind of thing. But it rarely has anything to do whatsoever with a kind of... Um, uh, with any real claim to to a hard concreteness. Now, I would claim that this is what makes the field exciting. Um, in the same way that, to me, a mathematician who's not super juiced up about the concept of infinity, and maybe that gray line between the infinite and the eternal, uh, the, 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 the astronomer who isn't kind of um, moved by the very idea of the cosmos, um, the historian for whom the nature of time, past, present, future, isn't a deep well that they don't understand. You know, you're, you're, you can't really get good at this stuff if you're not awed in some way. And, and I think with an artistic expression, this is really serious. I think ultimately the the reason artists and the arts exist is largely because because they're perfectly arbitrary things that people just can't stop doing. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so my first claim, I suppose, is that philosophy of education is arbitrary. And the relationship between philosophy and education is, is arbitrary, which forces us to take responsibility for what we make of it and forces us to take some responsibility for what we uh, choose 
to, uh, to read from it, what we choose to ignore from it, what we choose to select, what we choose to set down, and all these things. And um, this arbitrariness is, is a part of my biography. Again, I didn't even know this existed. Someone just told me and I just went to a meeting and then someone took me to another institution. And then 10 years down the road, I have tenure at a, at a, at a, at a university in Canada. I mean, this is all pretty arbitrary, right? Um, um, but I think that arbitrariness contains a gift within it, which is it allows um, the person, and in this case, I would say especially the teacher, who picks up philosophy of education in this more or less arbitrary way, to then decide to make meaning of it, to test what is worthwhile about it, also to decide what aspects of it it might want to discard or it might want to not uh engage with. Um, in other words, it forces, I think the arbitrary uh, forces one to make a decision. If I'm walking down the road one day and something random happens, the randomness forces me to respond um, in a way that is goes against all the rubrics of what I was doing, let's say I was walking to the drugstore. There's a shopper's drug smart up here. Uh, not like a pot shop, like a, like a prescription drug store, right? You know, I live in Vancouver, so there's a lot of pot shops up here. Um, but, you know, if I'm walking to the, to the drug store uh, to pick up a prescription and along the way um, someone is rolling watermelons down the sidewalk uh, in my way, it's pretty random. It's pretty arbitrary. And I have to decide that either I'm going to walk in a different direction. Maybe I'm fascinated by why in the world is someone on in early February rolling watermelons down a sidewalk. This is not normal. What's going on here? Uh, maybe I ask someone a question. In other words, the arbitrary, the random, the things that break us out of the natural attitude, the things that make the familiar strange, the things that um, uh, force us in a way outside of our interests and our will to um, to respond and, and to become responsible to something that we didn't expect. This to me is the the prime ground for philosophy. And in my experience of thinking about education and trying to practice, you might say, the art of education through the art of teaching, across these last 13, 14 years, one thing I've learned is that maybe one potentially non-arbitrary thing that philosophy and education have in common is precisely this fact that they're both can be really arbitrary. I mean, a classroom, especially when I was a kindergarten teacher, like no, no one, well, no one told me anything because I didn't go to any classes. So that was partially my fault. But I didn't realize that teaching Spanish K through eight entails for the K to about the three people peeing their pants. Like peeing your pants was not something in the playbook of Spanish language instruction. How to deal with, with an accident like that was not a part of the, that was someone rolling watermelons on the sidewalk. Um, and I realized that it was a, a very emotional thing because, you know, there was a ringleader and if and if the, the ringleader, um, she's probably, you know, uh, 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 in her 20s now, but you know, if, if that ringleader saw the person who peed their pants, she's gonna make a big deal of it, and then people were gonna make fun of them, and then uh, I would be responsible in some ways for that, so I wanted to be discreet about it. I also wanted to make sure that you know things were sanitary, and like it was a big deal, you know, I didn't expect that. Um, and I think things like that have happened in many cases. Last night I was teaching on my Zoom, uh, just like I am now. Um, and my entire internet signal just went dead as a doornail. Now I have an Ethernet connection. I try really hard to uh, to be <laughs> to 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 create a, a a studio environment where I can do the work in what I feel is a respectful and professional way uh, in terms of the equipment and the and the quality of the of things. But my internet signal died. I mean, it was like the the power went out, and so I got kicked out of my own Zoom meeting. I didn't expect that. I had to come back in and figure out what the heck was going on in my own class. It was, uh, it, it was alarming. And these moments, I think, uh, in the classroom, these moments in educational environments, um, just right now my, my webcam is letting me know that the battery is going down, um, and I'll replace that in a second. Um, these interruptions of sorts, um, I think, are something where we can find a common thread between philosophy and education, that at some level philosophy and education are both uh, 
entities that revel and really do, I would say, their best and most radical work in the arbitrary, in the random, in the sort of human experience or the human drama of, of, of life. Um, and this, uh, uh, so now I've made two claims in response to the two themes that I introduced at the beginning. The first question, uh, or the two related questions was, what is philosophy of education? And I basically said, it's something that someone made up and told me about one day, which therefore it follows to say it's kind of arbitrary. And then the second question was, what is the relationship between these two things, philosophy and education? And my claim is, following from the previous response to the question, that the thing that they have in common, the thing that, that philosophy and education share, uh, and maybe their connection is precisely at this nexus of, of, of reveling in this arbitrary, random, uh, uh, um, denatured um, uh, departures from the natural attitude, these moments of strangeness, that kind of stuff. There's a, a book uh, by Maxine Green from 1973, I believe, called The Teacher as Stranger. The Teacher as Stranger. It's hard to get these days, although in the U.S. you have more access to used books than we do in Canada. Um, but, but maybe there's a library there. If you can't find it, I've even bootlegged it uh, onto a website because I feel it's so important to have access to. And also, I'm pretty sure the, I'm sh well, Maxine Green passed away a few years ago, so I don't think her estate's going to uh, lose anything on the, uh, on the bootlegging of her book. The point, though, I'm making is that that book introduces, maybe in a more serious and formal way, this claim. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The Teacher as Stranger. The Teacher as Stranger. Thank you, Brittany. Um, that book, uh, in, in a much more probably serious and formal way, introduces the teacher as a, a character who is always, in some sense, strange and whose work it is to estrange people from their natural attitude, from their uh, common sense uh, of, 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 of things. And... Um, and so I'm using that here just as, as one more uh, source to, um, to give some justification for my second response, uh, to, my, to my response to the second question, what is the relationship between education and philosophy, which is that they're both at some level arbitrary, or that but they both kind of do their best work within the arbitrary. Um, so this is my introduction to um, philosophy of education, uh, philosophy and education. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I realize there's a sort of wit involved that uh, if you're going to say that something is arbitrary and so on and so forth, it can come off as unserious, but I'm dead serious about it. So I would invite you all, maybe now, to potentially pose some objections or uh, ask some questions or maybe... Um, uh, puzzle over this the this set of claims that are basically both uh, wrapping this uh, idea in the arbitrary. Um, uh, maybe ask me what exactly I mean by that word arbitrary. Maybe there's some limits to the arbitrariness here. Maybe it's arbitrary in this sense, but not in that sense. Um, but what do you think? Um, maybe you just don't like it, or maybe you do like it a lot for reasons that you, you might express. But what do you think about this claim that philosophy of education and the relationship between philosophy and education is, as I've said, arbitrary, random, happenstance, so to speak? Anyone? Does it seem plausible, implausible? I have a question. Sure. So if something's arbitrary, how do we know if we're studying it correctly? We don't. I mean, that's the thing. Um, we really honestly don't. Um, and again, I, when I say this, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I hope, I hope, I hope, I pray that uh, 
Dr. Lewis will, will maybe if, if, if in the future you're like, was that guy even being serious? Like, was that a, was that a joke or like, I, I, I don't like to speak, uh, I don't like to appeal to any kind of authority here. But ever since the day that Stephen Brookfield told me to check out philosophy of education to the present now that I'm sitting before you, I've done, I think, as deep a dive as a person can in the institutional sense into the formal study of philosophy of education from the credentials to the career path to the community of the philosophy of education society to to all those things there there isn't a lot at this point that i uh that i consider uh about the field at least i think i understand it mostly just through participation pretty well and yes when you get inside of it at the at the real nitty gritty uh, kind of where the sausage is made. Um, who gets to decide uh, what philosophy of education is every bit as arbitrary as uh, as I've introduced it, in that a lot of it has to do with the sort of political economy of educational research uh, and the political economy of the American uh, research university, which right now has kind of overtaken the... Um, uh, the Prussian and 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 uh, the Anglosphere's uh, colleges. Um, there's um, there's an enormous amount of uh, of 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 politics and economy, frankly, that uh, that dress up the arbitrary and and a kind of uh, costume that attempts to feign at a kind of authority. And I think, by the way, teachers do this all the time. Teachers love to think that there's something that kind of gives them credibility beyond the fact of being a teacher. My claim, though, is that there's an inside to teaching where the real credibility, I think, comes from. Um, and one of the most scandalous, but to me, most powerful ideas in, in, in the literature of philosophy of education, we could take this all the way to Plato in the uh, 430 B BCE, is the fact that he has this... this um, phrase in his in his dialogue the Mino he says all learning and, and recollection I'm sorry all learning and inquiry it's early all learning and inquiry don't quote Plato at six at seven in the morning all learning and inquiry is but recollection he says and the word in Latin uh, is not in Latin in, in Attic Greek for that is anamnesis which means something like um like memory but it's not a memory it's it's the mind's movement through its for Plato would be the soul or something, the spirit or something like that. It's this very kind of spiritual idea that Plato had. Um, the the uh, the implication of that idea that all learning and inquiry is but recollection is that no one can learn for someone else. No one can recollect for someone else. No one can inquire for someone else. Therefore, every teacher that stands before a student stands at a lack. In other words, they can model a kind of inquiry, a kind of learning, but they can't actually learn or inquire for the student. And so out of this comes this powerful idea that, 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 that from, from, from two and a half millennia ago all the way to the present in a book like Jean Jacques Rancière's Ignorant Schoolmaster, this idea that, that no one can teach but the inner teacher. And the inner teacher is not the teacher who stands outside of you with authority and credentials and arbitrary um, institutional uh, power, but the true teacher, the only teacher who can learn, who can recollect, who can inquire, is always on the inside of the conscience of the person. And, and, and this idea that, that one, everyone with a soul, everyone with a mind, everyone with the ability to recollect can learn and, and inquire, so equality of intelligence. And on the other hand, no one can do that for someone else. People can only do that themselves. I mean, this is to me as, as, as radical and as universal a set of teachings that you can find actually um, across numerous cultures, numerous traditions, wisdom traditions, religious traditions, um, uh, philosophical traditions, discourses. 
Um, it's one of the bases of, of everything from epistemology, the study of knowledge, to neurology. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and the, well, some of the reasons why we don't understand uh, anesthesia is because we don't know what it means to be conscious or to be awake or to be asleep. And, and we're really just kind of doing some guesswork at some level. You'd be shocked how arbitrary uh, anesthesia is as, as an actual um, uh, medical routine. So, I mean, um, yes, I would claim both from a two and a half millennia old tradition that I, that I, that I hold dear and that I'm, that I've been educated in and that I understand to some extent in, in some limited way to, you know, uh, over a dozen years in the actual field that absolutely the arbitrariness of philosophy of education and philosophy and education um, disempowers a lot of claims to authority and it it humbles a lot of so-called mighty uh, institutions uh, credentials and and ideas and but I think that the people who can benefit from that uh, 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 humbling of, of of the mighty are often common school teachers and people who really care about education because of its randomness and and, and now I want to get to a Emily's wonderful question do you feel as if the institutionalization of education reduces that human connection that can be found within the arbitrary I want to give a qualified yes to this so I think Emily's a very um, astute uh, she's reading between the lines of, of some of my, uh, wh not just what I'm saying, but sort of what my saying is doing. <laughs> uh, and so you're, 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 you're definitely, um, I would say we're communicating here. But let me be, uh, so I want to introduce a new distinction to, 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 to qualify, though, my answer. Um, one of the great tragedies of common language in the study of education and in general society at large, has been the conflation of two words to to be synonymous. And I claim that they're not synonymous. Education and schooling. So for a lot of people, education and schooling are basically just two different words for the same basic thing. I want to argue, and I think it follows from the things I've shared and also this question that Emily has asked, forces us to consider that perhaps education is a wider cosmos within which schooling is a, a star. Now, if, if you looked at the heavens at night and you confused the, the cosmos with the North Star, well, first of all, you're, you're, you'd be wrong. <laughs> objectively you you would be um, uh, you would be over determining uh, your uh, account of your observation of the North Star now it doesn't mean though that the North Star doesn't exist it doesn't mean that the North Star isn't the North Star it doesn't mean that you can't navigate with it it doesn't mean that it's not um, astronomically Literally, astronomic is a study of the stars as opposed to the sort of, uh, that's astros means uh, stars. Um, it, it's, it's appropriate to, to maybe take interest in the North Star, but it's inappropriate to claim that, that a star can even monopolize a galaxy, much less the cosmos. It's my claim that, that within uh, our ways of thinking about education, we've allowed the star of schooling. And in this case, we don't mean schooling, because school is actually a galaxy, not a star. There are different kinds of schools. Down the, down the road here, there's Rufus Guitar Store, which is my guitar shop, and they have a school. They have teachers who charge people tuition, who come in in the evening, and they and they study uh, guitar. Uh, in many cases, they use those studies to matriculate into um, actual higher education. They go on to, um, uh, um, in some cases, the the you know the better students, the the ones who who actually practice and do their work, uh, they go on to conservatories or to uh, programs of music and stuff. Um, we also have wonderful arts programs, I think, here in our public schools and whatnot. But my point, though, is that like we don't even mean it when we say schooling and education are equivalent. What we're really talking about is compulsory schooling, which is attending schooling under penalty of law. 
And those laws are truancy laws. Um, and if we mean attending school under penalty of law, well, that was invented in the 19th century. Early in the 19th century, it was invented in the country of Prussia, modern-day Germany. Um, and Horace Mann from the uh, state of Massachusetts, he was the first secretary of education of that state. He traveled by boat three times to Prussia to learn from that German uh, uh, common school experiment. And he, through the Whig Party in the 1830s, founded the common school movement in the United States, which led to the ratification of the first truancy laws or compulsory schooling laws in 1856 and 1857 in the states of New York and Massachusetts. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about schooling. We're not even talking about schools um, in general because schools are much bigger and older. So I would say we actually have to have a tripart distinction here um, if we want to understand this institutionalization of education. Education, I would claim, is, is a cosmic entity. It's vast, it's mysterious, it's difficult. It's in some sense as arbitrary as the cosmos is. It's just kind of out there <laughs> in a way. Um, I also see it as more of a context than an actual object. I don't think it's something we can point to in like ones and twos and threes and fours. I think it's more of like this kind of uh, oceanic thing that we're kind of adrift in kind of a way. But then when we talk about schooling, I think we have to distinguish between compulsory schooling or attending school under penalty of law which is what most professional uh, teacher training programs are preparing teachers to do, which is to enter into a profession where they are qualified and allowed um, to, um, to become an agent, in many, in many cases of the state in some way, uh, at, a, at, a, at an institution where these things... Now, some of you might say that, like, oh, Sam must hate these schools because they're laws. No, it's just a fact. Truancy laws are, are real, and, and attendance requirements and things like that are, are real. And it's just historically distinct that the eight, 1857 to 2021 uh project of, of, of compulsory schooling is very different than the conservatory of music in general or schools of thought or other kinds of schools that have existed uh, uh, throughout the world in, in, in numerous cases. Um, the university, for instance, is a slightly older institution, even if we talk about the Prussian Research University, which came out of the same society. If we carry it all the way back to the University of the Middle Ages, the University of Salamanca, if we go to the sort of Islamic Golden Age and look at the great institutions of learning, if we go to um, Plato's Academy or Aristotle's Lyceum or to Alexander the Great's home in Macedonia where he was being tutored by... I mean, we could take this kind of wherever we want. My point is that we're not talking about compulsory schooling, schooling on, going to school under penalty of law when we're doing that. And so I think one thing that um, that is reduced is not only the human connection found within the arbitrary, but actually the fact that the arbitrary gives us a better analytic account of the descriptive realities that are actually at stake when we're using words like education, schooling, compulsory schooling. I, and it allows us to make meaningful speech. So when we go out at night, we're not talking about the Milky Way as if it was the North Star or the, 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 he, the sky, the heavens. Uh, I think of the, the Lion King. You all know that, that scene where Pumbaa and Timon and Simba are laying on the grass and they're looking up at the stars and they're asking what's up there. Yeah, I love that scene. Um, it's a very uh, uh, cosmic uh, scene and, and also has like fart jokes and that's that's funny to me. So, you know, the point though I'm making is that like this, this institutionalization of education, not only agreeing with Emily, reduces the kind of humanness, the organic sense of 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 our of our relationship to each other as human beings it also really sucks at being institutional <laughs> like it's hor it's not a particularly sophisticated account of 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 real stuff and it actually um uh, allows people to confuse things in fairly categorical ways and it might even i would say uh, disempower the people who have confused those things because they don't they literally just don't know what they're doing and I don't mean that in some sort of sense of like it's their fault but it's it's like being lost in a really complicated uh, a city where you don't have a map and it's like well I've never been here before when I moved to the Twin Cities I drove around St. Paul and Minneapolis like six times one day it took me like three and a half hours because I was lost I didn't know where to go the, the person who doesn't know how to distinguish the Milky Way from the North Star from the cosmos is lost up there. And to ask them then to, to, to 
to do something constructive is, I think, deeply unjust. It's a travesty. I think the same thing is true of the teacher who's asked to teach and be an educator in some meaningful way for meaningful, gainful employment and pay, but doesn't get, equip them with, with these kind of philosophical tools to, to maybe, maybe the human connection is too fuzzy or too touchy-feely for you. I'm into it. I, I'm, I'm, that's, that's kind of, for me, the pay dirt. But I would also say it also prevents you from knowing what the heck is going on, from knowing who you're, who the stakeholders are in the actual school you're working in and how they may differ at different strata and where your points of access to, uh, uh, to power are and are not, um, where those brokers are, are made and not made and so, so on and so forth. So, uh, Emily, I, I, I do feel this institutionalization does reduce the human connection, but I would actually add to that that it also reduces the sort of the connection of, of, of sensible understanding of what the heck is going on at all. I think a lot of institutionalized education is actually uh, um, um, a maze that, that is often hard to navigate. So what these people are struggling to distinguish. So to me, it's a struggle to distinguish, for instance, between compulsory schooling, uh, attending school under penalty of law, uh, schooling in general, the kind of the, the, the star, the galaxy, and then education as a much wider thing. So it's very common for us to talk about and, and, and make what we think is meaningful speech about education when what we really mean is something like compulsory schooling or to talk about schooling or schools whenever what we really mean are compulsory schools and we don't actually mean every possible school in the world. Um, and, and that to me is, um, it is, is not just a matter of how we talk or, or what kind of uh, words we're using. But it even affects, in some ways, our ability to then uh, have a, a categorical understanding of what we're dealing with. So when you're dealing in a program in like teacher education, where the outcome is not only a academic credential but also a professional credential, like like um, uh, that entails all kinds of things, not only for you but also for the program. The program can't just be academic; it also has to be accredited by a professional body, and that entails all kinds of different relationships and stakeholders in that relationship. And this brings up the kind of political economy, and um, and it's going to govern in some cases where you're able to deploy that credential. Now, in most states in the United States, for instance, will uh, transfer. Um, uh, teacher accreditation credentials across state lines, but that's complicated, and it's complicated for a reason. And those reasons are caught up in the way in which compulsory schooling um, was um, uh, was instituted. It goes actually all the way back to the 19th century. In many cases, the states were not amendable to instituting compulsory schooling laws, so the federal government used other um, things like um, federal highways, such as, oh, you want a federal highway, don't you? That would increase interstate commerce, wouldn't it? You want to use federal tax dollars for that and not state levied or municipal. Okay, ah, fantastic. We agree with you. It's for the common good. So let's do that. And oh, by the way, also, you're going to pass a law just like the one that Massachusetts did a, a decade ago, which you've been kind of sitting on. So what do you say? R can we do a deal? Yeah, sure. Okay. Compulsory schooling laws enter the state of Missouri, right? Um, these kinds of, um, this is the kind of bargaining and work um, that happens. And, uh, and so for me, the ability to distinguish between when we're having a conversation about education, all things considered, in its widest sense, is one thing. When we're having a discussion about schools and schooling and teaching, for that matter, in its widest sense, that's great. When we're having a very focused discussion, though, about educational policy or teaching in a credentialed professional sense within a compulsory schooling environment, within a particular state, within a particular uh, um, uh, district, within a particular school, under a particular principal and vice principal and school board and parents uh, organizations and, and all that kind of stuff, we're having a different conversation. My claim is that um, I, I would hope that the, the, the one who is in the school working under the auspices of all those different uh, players is capable of, of modulating uh, their discussion from what we're doing in our school today, what's happening in my classroom, um, in the institutional immediate sense, to what's happening in my classroom and its relationship to schools in general. So where you can see your school is not just an institutional immediate political school, but also as like Rufus Guitar is like, what's my craft? What do I teach? 
what, uh, do, am I teaching things that I'm good at and that I care about? And if I'm not, why? Um, <laughs> um, um, uh, that kind of stuff. If my guitar teacher just can't make a clear D come out of their guitar, yikes. Um, uh, so, you know, and then, um, and then beyond that, though, that we can also talk about education in a wider sense and to be able to move in a meaningful way between these stages of volume, these dynamic stages, where you have a kind of quiet pianissimo, we're talking about the stuff right here, right now, to a more moderate, full-toned discussion that's a bit bigger, all the way to the kind of fortissimo of education, you know, writ large. That th That's the struggle I sometimes sense. And I teach in our teacher education program here. In Canada, we have a different political arrangement. So in Canada, you can't study, at least in our, in our province in Canada. <laughs> See, I did the same thing. In, in British Columbia, you can't study education as an undergraduate subject in as an undergraduate major. You have to get an undergraduate major and then take a B ed, which is another undergraduate certification major which is tacked on to your four-year degree in order to then be given a, um, a credential um, to become a teacher in the public schools uh, here. Um, and so I, I teach in our program here, the TEO, the Teacher Education Office. And so this is at least a, a, a distinction that I see people struggle with. But in every place I've taught, um, uh, when I was a TA at Ohio State, whenever I taught at Wabash College in Indiana, when I taught at North, uh, University of North Dakota, um, when I've talked with people, I think sometimes it's difficult to make these distinctions that I claim come out of this precisely arbitrary understanding of things because the arbitrary kind of forces us to say, okay, well, what's real here? What, what makes sense and what doesn't? Anyhow, um, any questions about that? Any um, maybe uh, disputes or, or critiques or um, clarifications? Um, if it's okay with you, I thought maybe I would pick up some of your questions. Um, that besides the, these wonderful questions that you've asked here in your um, in your chat, so I'm just navigating here. I'm not on Facebook, I promise. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit selective, if that's okay. Um, mainly because I'm sorry, I'm supposed to say they were all fantastic questions, and they pro and they were in in many ways. But I d did have one that's my favorite, so. I'm just going to not pretend that I don't have a favorite question. Um, and I'd like to, to take that question on first. So no offense to all the questions asked. And thank you for all the questions asked. But um, uh, uh, Maxwell, I think you cheated and uh, maybe looked up my biography a little bit or something. Um, but your cheating worked in this case because <laughs> you... Uh, have uh, triangulated a, 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 a real passion and another intersection uh, that I've already even introduced through metaphor and through some personal biography. Uh, but that's the relationship between philosophy of education and music. Um, and so the first question, it's a series of questions. Do you use music to discuss philosophy at all in your classes? Yes, all the time. Uh, if so, in what ways? Okay, uh, I'll give you a few examples. Um, First, um, music is uh, among the oldest uh, explicitly named curricular subjects of political education. And, and I'm speaking here very, um, uh, with a very particular um, book in mind. So in Plato's Collected Dialogues, the, his great political treatise, The Republic, the, uh, the book, uh, it's, a, it's a fiction, right? It's just like a dialogue of Plato, of, of Socrates, Plato's teacher, and a bunch of other people, Glaucon and others. Um, Socrates and Glaucon are walking back up from the south of Athens called Piraeus. It's a port city. And on their way up, some friends kind of accost them and say, hey, we're having a party. You have to come. And if you don't come, we're going to drag you there. And they're like, okay. And so they end up going to this party, and at the beginning they walk into the front of the of the house, and there's an old man uh, who's on his on his way to pray, and they talk to him about old age, and 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 eventually the, the subject comes up of of the of the question of what is justice. Very random, very arbitrary. Ah, my camera is reminding me about um, the battery. I'll have to replace it in a few seconds. Anyhow. 
out of that question of what is the meaning of justice, uh, what is the just person, um, there's this one guy named Thrasymachus who just flips out and yells at Socrates and yells at everybody else, saying, don't listen to this guy, he's an idiot. He always plays these stupid games where he runs around and says all these things. And, you know, justice is power. The people who say that justice is something more than power are just trying to have, take power over you. And so there's this confrontation between a, a moral idea of justice, that justice is to do the good, uh, and justice as power, which is justice as this kind of political um, uh, means to get whatever you want, right? And this is the confrontation of justice in book one of the Republic. But towards the end of book one and the beginning of book two, um, Socrates does a pretty good job of answering Thrasymachus, and people around are like, oh, dang, that was good. But Glaucon, his closest friend, confesses to him afterwards that, you know, Socrates, I'm actually not buying your response to Thrasymachus. Like, it was pretty good. A lot of people were convinced. Thrasymachus, you got him to shut up. But I kind of want to go through it more carefully. I think you missed some spots and some details. And since you know I'm your friend, don't be mad at me. Help me understand this more deeply and better. And Socrates says, okay, fine. And so they decide to do an experiment where they just say, um, Let's not consider justice as this singular entity that, that an individual person can be or not be. Let's think about justice as it operates in a city, a polis. And so they move from justice as an individual account to social justice, justice in a social, in a society. And immediately when they do that, they say, well, what is our society made up of? Well, let's have some carpenters. Okay, cool. I don't know why carpenters, totally arbitrary, but the carpenters. What else do we need? Well, we need some people to farm. Okay, great. What else do we need? Well, we need some builders of, of, of things that aren't carpentry. Okay. And they start, they start populating their imaginary city. And eventually they say, well, everyone has a job here in this city we've, we've imagined, and that's cool, but who's going to protect them? Like, who's going to take care of the city as their domain of, of life? And they say, who's going to be, who are going to be the guardians of the city? Like, oh, that's a good idea. Well, let's have a guardian class. And this guardian class becomes something like a model of statesmanship or something like that. Anyhow, they immediately move, and I promise music is going to come up. They immediately move from the guardians of the city to, well, what are the conditions for these guardians? I mean... How do we distinguish them from the carpenter, from everyone else? And they immediately say, well, they'll have to be educated in a very particular political way. And would you know that the first thing that Plato says that their education needs to consist of is it needs to consist of a very regulated, very censored, actually, um, diet of poetry. And when the Greeks were talking about poetry, they were talking about epic verse. And if you know anything about epic verse, this was not... Um, text, it was oral poetry that was usually delivered in the modes of the Greek Isles, Mixolydian, Lydian, Diatonic, like all that kind of stuff. Those names all come from the Greek islands. So the modes of music that we now, that you study in, in a conservatory or what have you, are actually names taken from early, before they were playing chords, when they were playing single note uh, lines, uh, these kind of modes of expression uh, that were particular to, 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 a, to a particular province or island or polis in, in the Greek Isles. And so immediately the discussion turns from <laughs> justice to social justice to guardians to the education of the guardians to the curriculum of the education of the guardians and the first subject they talk about is music, poetry. Uh, mixolydian should we use minor sounding uh, modes or maybe we should use only major sounding modes and 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 it's kind of this 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 tension between tragedy and comedy between darkness and light this ad attempt to give them an education that makes them sufficiently wise to not be taken advantage of and to be able to protect but not so aggressive that they're going to turn on anybody and and uh, and hurt them and, and and it's a very kind of difficult uh, uh, calculus so the first uh, response or example to your question of and so in what ways is that it's my contention that if you want to teach philosophy at all within and by the way a lot of people say Plato is the father of Western philosophy this is technically not true Platonism and Greek philosophy certainly spread into the Roman Empire if you look to the left of your map it also spread to the east 
um, into the, the, the Persian Empire, uh, the Syrian Empire, the Egyptian Empire. Uh, it, it, it had a vast influence upon, in particular, uh, Arabic and particularly Islamic thought uh, to come uh, much later. Uh, it, it intermixed with the Indus Valley, and Sanskrit, and the Bhaktivedanta Gita, and, the, and these things. I don't know if it, made it, if it made it all the way to the Tao Te Chi or anything like that, but it definitely had a much far and greater influence than the so-called Western tradition that we often take for granted. Uh, the greatest philosopher of, uh, of, of the Arabic language, uh, or at least the one who's mentioned the most, is Aristu. Aristu in Arabic means Aristotle. <laughs> so um, this is often taken for granted that if you're studying philosophy in, in Turkey and you're studying philosophy at Youngstown State University, you're probably studying um, a, a very similar looking set of ideas, one explicitly, in many cases, Western, and in another case, explicitly non-Western or even anti-Western, yet similar uh, Hellenic um, roots in that case. Um, and the Greeks themselves weren't very Western at all. If you read Herodotus and Thucydides, they're mostly talking about Egyptians. They're frankly like obsessed with Egypt. I didn't really get that part. But anyway, um, I guess Egypt is is cool. Um, no offense to Egyptians. I, it is cool. Um, so I teach, I teach music not only because it is um, an interest of mine from the side of my life as a musician, but because I believe that philosophy itself, and in particular philosophy of education, when we ask questions not only of justice and social justice, but also questions of um, the, the education of a particular group. Um, now this is a very elitist account of education, ultimately. It's an aristocratic class. Although the guardians were weird aristocrats, they weren't allowed to own property or money. They took kind of vows of poverty. So it's like monastic elitism of sorts, uh, which of course was a thing in the Middle Ages. Like the uh, monks and you know were under vows of poverty, yet still they kind of exercised a kind of oversized uh, role in, in society. And we can kind of see that extending to, to teachers today. Um, all that to say that I not only teach music because of my interest in music, I also teach it because I believe that philosophy is musical. And I believe there's gobs of evidence for this. And most philosophers take this for granted. I think, <laughs> well, I think it's partially because they're not musicians, so they don't care <laughs> about music to begin with. But I also think it's, it's, it's a problem that they don't pay attention um, to the unique and, and absolute role uh, of music, and not only, not of just music, but in particular of the arts. And here I want to say especially what we would call the arts of spirit. Uh, um, so here I'm not talking principally about the plastic arts, I'm really talking about the performative arts, the arts of expression that don't generate material objects. So, you know, that, that form of ethereal um, art, I think, is at the very core of philosophy. Because when you think about it, the mathematician, the philosopher, and the artist who is the spiritual artist, so, so the musician, the dancer, uh, um, uh, the poet, um, uh, if you don't take in mind the recordings and the uh, text and all that stuff, but at, at the most kind of performative level, one thing they have in common is they sort of, um, they work in the abstract. They work in non-material uh, uh, mediums. Um, the, 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 they all use the thought experiment as a primary vehicle for their ideas. And I'm here talking about Einstein, um, the trolley car experiment, the elevator experiment, relatively general relativity. So the application of mathematical, uh, um, thought experiments into physics all the way to, uh, the, 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 the fine, the, the, what are called the fine and performing arts. Um, no offense, by the way, to plastic artists and visual artists out there. Just, I think in education, we kind of, they, they, they get a lot of the pie without, <laughs> without, uh, um, uh, without justification, I believe. Um, so this is a little shot, uh, in, in art education across there. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I do too. Um, uh, but I also think um, within education, and this is the last thing I'll say, the plastic arts are actually really important. So a lot of people who picked up Plato through Neoplatonism, um, all around the kind of uh, Afro-Eurasia, 
So North Africa, um, the, the, the present day Middle East, um, the, the kind of Mediterranean parts of Europe to the Iberian Peninsula, that kind of area. Um, they quickly began to form an idea of education that goes back to some of the things I said about Plato's Mino and Anamnesis, where the idea of education was built on this idea of the image. And the image is, uh, uh, oh, the image is native to, to definitely the plastic and visual arts because of that ocular metaphor. Even in Plato's Book 7, he says that the, the art of education is not to put sight into the eye, but to allow the eye to see, right? That's the same idea that education comes from the inside. It can't be imposed from the outside. Um, I love to pair that with Stevie Wonder's 1973 album, Inner Visions, and the cover of that album, which I think is such a powerful cover of, of this, you know, uh, um, blind musician artist who sees in, 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 in these kind of cosmic rays uh, across there. I think that's a, a really powerful description of what Plato's talking about there. But the idea of education in relationship to the image uh, comes out through this idea of actually sculpture and the and the plastic arts uh, in their most um, you could say three dimensional uh, depiction, and this is nested within the concept of Bildung, which is a German word for education, but comes through theology because Bild in German means image. Bildung means, in some sense, for the image to appear, and the appearance of the image and the sculpture is that the image is on the inside of the rock. The image isn't out there. The image is in there. And so when you're sculpting, you're, 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 you're liberating the, the, the image from, from the form of the rock. This is building. This is education. This is formation. Um, and this is consistent with both the, the Platonic, Neoplatinian, um, uh, Meister Eckhart's theological apparatus, all the way into the German uh, ideas in, in Prussia that were eventually spread across the ocean in the common school movement. These were kind of the, the motivating concepts of education. So all that to say that, yes, I talk about music in my classes and philosophy all the time, but I don't talk about it because it's not because it's out there on the outside and I love music and so I just talk about it here. I talk about it in claiming that, that, that music and more specifically art is the prime matter, is the atomic element of philosophy. In fact, if you were to crack the code of my claim earlier that philosophy of education is arbitrary, probably the best reason I could give or the most honest reason is because it must be art and art must be arbitrary. Um, when you formalize art uh, to any extent, uh, you lose something about it. Yet art can still be very formal, very technical, very demanding, very rigorous. But you always take for granted that within that rigor, it's never for its own sake. There always, there's always an expressive capacity. Even the most representational, conservative desire to simply mimic the natural world. Even there, there's still expression, there's still movement, there's still line, there's still emotion, uh, all those kinds of things. So yes, I teach music uh, in all my classes, but not just because it's not just music, but art and, and in some of these ways. And so the parallels between my development as a musician and my development of myself of, as, an, as a person, this is a beautiful question to which I have no answer other than because of my own formation, because of my own building, because of the way in which the rock of myself has been chipped away at, um, it's been chipped away a lot through the six strings and, and, and 12 invariably frets of, of, of a guitar neck and, and the body of a guitar. And, um, and so, so there's even a sense in which my sense of who I am as a person and my sense of, of, of the guitar as an instrument uh, it's not always clear to me where the boundary lies. Now, it's not that like I literally think I'm a guitar walking around. That's bizarre. Um, but it's that there's, 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 there's a pathos between myself um, and, uh, thank you so much, Morgan, uh, and, and, and the guitar as an instrument. And in fact, it confuses me. Um, I've thought a lot about the fact that a luthier who makes guitars, for instance, has a certain relationship to the instrument that's almost um, why well, turn to the luthier for repairs, for instance. I ask them to, 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 to fix and to, to help me maintain. They're the guardian, in some sense, of, of my musical city. I can show you my guitars, by the way. Uh, that's uh, my Pengua from Paracho, Michoacan. Uh, and this is my Martin acoustic. Um, thank you. 
And over there, I don't know if you can see around my monitor, but those those are my electric guitars. Um, most they're all highly modded by luthiers. Uh, mostly, some of them I did myself. Um, but I've thought about this relationship between the luthier uh, and their relationship to the instrument, and me as an instrumentalist, who in a way know less about the instrument formally, couldn't cut a nut for, 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 for a guitar, couldn't do a number of tasks that are very quite technical, can barely do a truss rod. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, but who, on the other hand, I mean, there's a lot of luthiers who can play their tails off. But, I mean, for myself, for expressing what I feel, for, for, for developing my uh, extension of my voice as an artist, the luthier can't, can't do that for me. Uh, and they and they in many cases because they focus on the craft of making uh instruments they can't focus uh necessarily uh, entirely at least on the craft of making music or if they do they do so in almost two different realms there's the luthier guitarist self and then there's the the guitar player guitar self i think about this a lot in terms of education and teaching because on the one hand i teach teachers about teaching but I think that I do it more like a luthier and less like a like a player. Because um, in some sense, I think that's what the job demands. And I think at some level, that's sort of what the, um, that's what's appropriate to, the, to that particular setting. And when I do that, I'm in some sense performing the very thing. It's like a luthier playing a concert in their workshop of truss rod adjustment instead of an arpeggio or like it's a very to me teaching is actually a confounding art <laughs> it's a very difficult art to, to make sense of uh through this musical analogy which is a which is an analogy that's been done um thank you so much jenna and madison and carrington oh my gosh <laughs> thank you all um uh it, it's an analogy that's quite um that's all over the tradition and so not only do i not have a good way to distinguish between myself as a musician and myself as a person, I'm not even entirely sure that I can distinguish between um, my relationship to music and the guitar between the sort of craft of the luthier and the performance of, of the artist. I, but, but this is a tension I'm actually working out in my work right now. Aristotle distinguishes between praxis, which is action, poesis, which is making, and theoria, which is thinking. And I think he's on to something. I think he gets something. I think there's something there that's really important. But I struggle with it. I, I don't understand it very well. And I sometimes confuse myself terribly. And so I use these analogies with music not only to understand Aristotle, but also to put Aristotle to the test. Because if he can't pass <laughs> the test, then, then, then I'm going to, 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 to push back, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to potentially um, uh, have something to say. So I've only gotten to one question, but I hope you can see why I only um, got to that one question. And I hope I can encourage you, uh, Maxwell, and all of you, though, that if you have a medium of, of art, that please don't restrict it from your teaching. And if you don't feel like you have a technical medium from the fine or plastic or performance arts, please consider if you would, in a kind of final request, please at least I would ask you, I would beg you really, to consider your work as a teacher as your medium of art. And that's going to require, I believe, for the reasons I've, I've given, uh, a certain arbitrariness that will probably, which you'll, you'll lose some authority and you might lose some credibility and you might lose some of the fancy, cool trappings of of, of the teacher's identity, but I think you'll gain something far greater um, if you if you if you refuse uh, to um, to alienate your teaching of, uh, as a form of art. And, and to me, one of my great projects and a project that I think I share with a lot of art educators, in, in including Dr. Lewis, is this kind of almost ethical and moral commitment to fight truly <laughs> to fight. For, a, for an understanding of teaching and for a conception of the teacher 
uh, as an art and as and, and the teacher as an artist uh, in the most technical sense with all the bona fides of the mediums of the fine and performing and, and plastic arts but with an integrity it can have on its own so if you haven't been an artist before know that if you want to be a teacher you're going to have to be one now and i would say that's kind of non-negotiable but we don't have time to get into that anyway well, that's all i have Dr. Rocha, I, I have a class at 11 and i know we have a few people who've had to you know we have students who are a combination in person and remote and um so i so I, you know i really really appreciate your time incredible generosity at, at particularly at this hour thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for responding to our questions and provoking so many more questions uh, it, it has been an it has been an honor and a gift, and uh, and uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, yeah. To follow up, but uh, again, thank you so much. It's it's been wonderful. So I'm going to have to end our meeting at this time. Sure, if thank you. you. Would like to request a link to the Zoom if you want to rewatch this and catch some of those amazing book references Dr. Rosha shared. Please email me at ll. L E W I S L L Lewis O two at YSU at EDU. Thank you, Dr. Rosha. Yeah, thank you all. Have a great day, everyone.